This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Hello and welcome, I'm Ed Hyland, and today our program about research takes a look at a seemingly harmless problem, but one that is having unforeseen effects on our environment and in keeping our homes cool. We'll go up on the roof for that research. And then it's time to rev up the engines, turbines to be exact, and show how researching the little things can mean plenty when it comes to improving efficiency. Details on these stories and much more here on Zenith. The University of Central Florida Technology Incubator, cultivating success through creative ideas, performance, and partnerships. Because there's a lot of people doing a lot of work every day, and that's what everybody brings together. So they, it wouldn't be successful without the partnerships. The UCF Technology Incubator is a university-driven community partnership providing early stage technology companies with the enabling tools, training, and infrastructure to create financially stable, high growth enterprises. With locations in the Central Florida Research Park adjacent to the UCF campus in East Orlando and in downtown Orlando, the UCFTI is home to over 50 new and innovative high-tech companies. That's up from 12 companies when the incubator opened its doors in 1999. The incubator has created hundreds of high-paying jobs in Central Florida with an average annual salary of $59,000. <laughs> Our clients include Cognoscenti Health Institute. Cognoscenti's 6,500 square foot clinical laboratory is located at the UCF Technology Incubator. Cognoscenti is introducing state-of-the-art molecular diagnostic technologies while building a fully web-enabled information system. Uh, we, when we opened the door, we had eight employees, including myself. Currently, we have over 50 employees at four different locations. The UCF Technology Incubator, promoting optimal corporate growth and making a significant contribution to the economic development of the region's high technology sector. In this time of soaring energy prices, drivers know that keeping your car tuned will help save some money. At the University of Central Florida, researchers are working with much larger engines, turbines, the kind that drive jets and power plants. What they are seeking is more than a tune-up. It's ways to tweak the actual design to make it more efficient. We, we are focusing on the cooling of gas turbine components that are in contact with hot gas bath. And typically those components are going to melt if we do not do any special cooling efforts because the gas is few hundred degrees hotter than the what metals can take. So we have to come up with pretty advanced technologies to make sure the planes are flying and the power plants are producing power. The vertical rig that you see here, uh, that couples two different cooling technology and one of them is called film cooling and one is called impingement cooling and what happens is that you have got a hot metal surface and you want to protect it from the hot gas uh, going over it so that it doesn't melt. So you impinge cold air from the back side that we call impingement cooling and then some of that air comes out through small holes in the surface 
and create a cold blanket on the top, kind of protecting from the hot gas. And that is called film cooling. Now, people have studied that in separation, but here we put them together to see how they interact with each other, how one affects the other. So it is more like exactly the way Siemens or GE or Mitsubishi would be designing their engines, uh, how that play out in a real engine. We are trying to optimize that so that we do not have to leave, say, 20% design margin in the actual engine. We can bring that closer, which will, in a sense, reduce uh, fuel cost for the airplane or reduce the cost of electricity at our home. That basically uh, mimics the flow as it goes through the hot, hot flow, as it goes through the airfoils. And again, as I said, that temperature is few hundred degrees hotter than that metal can take. Uh, and that is what really produces the power or produces the power in the airplane or produces the power in the power plant. Now, uh, in that big rig, we mimic the same type of aerodynamic condition, meaning the Mach numbers, which is the number, the, a, a quantity that we like to mimic between the actual operation and a laboratory testing like ours, so that we know the results out of our, our testing can be applicable to the results in the engine. And the way we measure the temperature is that we coat the surface where we are trying to measure the temperature with a special paint, and then we sign that blue light on that paint and the molecules absorb the light and give out a radiation that is somehow captures the information about the temperature of the surface and or the pressure of the surface. So in that case, we are only measuring temperature. So we have got a blue light coming in with a very specific wavelength uh, of radiation. And then we have got a special camera also, which kind of captures that radiation coming out of the surface. We break up into pixel by pixel description of the whole surface, and we know at every pixel what is the temperature by looking at the radiation information. You have got flow at really high speed with real high Mach numbers going through the airfoils and creating all sorts of uh, motions there. That has got a tremendous impact on the performance of those film cooling or the cooling technologies. Again, typical university laboratories, they do at low speed uh, rig which are far detached from the actual engine performance. And as a result, uh, the one-to-one -one correlation has got some problem. What we are doing is we can correlate our result much closer to the engine performance. Now, let us face it. The engine runs about, say, 2,600 degree Fahrenheit or 3,000 degree Fahrenheit. We typically cannot do that in a lab. So we have to go make sure that what we are doing in the lab is just not for academic purpose, but it can be actually applied for the engine. So the real engine designer can make a safer airplane or a cheaper power plant. UCF is working closely with technology leader Siemens Corporation to operate a center for advanced turbines and energy research. Up next, to some people it's just a dirty roof. But what that dirt has been doing to our environment and the cost of heating our homes just might surprise you. Details coming up on Zenith. Most people know that a white roof is the most energy efficient, especially in a state like Florida. But not only do few people actually have a white roof, most of our roofs are darkened by algae growth. Dr. Clovis Linkus has been on the faculty at the Florida Solar Energy Center, University of Central Florida, since 1990, and has been researching the problem. Welcome so much. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, just how much does an algae-covered roof really impact energy efficiency? Well, the uh, heat gain by the roof or by the attic represents uh, perhaps 15% of the cooling load that you're, you have to supply um, in, in midsummer. And so the reflectivity of a clean roof is around 70, 80% depending on building material. But as it becomes uh, darkened by algae growth, it can very quickly drop to uh, around 50%. And so that figures out to uh, a significant amount of your energy bill in terms of having to uh, uh, heat the, uh, or cool the additional uh, heat gain by your roof. 
Now we've got some pictures we'll be showing folks during the course of our discussion, but uh, I want to try and get into the, the process of, of how do you go about testing and what are you finding about uh, different types of materials and basically the ability to, to inhibit this kind of growth on our roofs and, and also other parts of our buildings. Well, uh, first thing we learned is that there's many different species of algae in the state of Florida, but there are some specific uh, circumstances in which there's a concentrated species. Uh, certainly, uh, particularly on the rooftops. Uh, the rooftop in a, in a house in the state of Florida is a rather hostile place for a, a small cellular organism to, to make a living. But there's a particular genus, the, the glia capsa genus of algae, that has figured out how to basically synthesize its, its own UV blocker and hang tight there on the roof through the summer uh, and then does its growing in the winter time. And, but, uh, so what you see on the roof, those black streaks that you'll see uh, along a roof line, uh, is because the algae has found a, a small indenture, indenture or where the, uh, the moisture level might be a little greater or it's just where the water flow coming off the roof line flows and they'll, they'll, they'll anchor themselves and begin to propagate from there. So should I just spray an algicide on my roof or is there a more efficient way to, to go about doing this? Well, algicides are, are okay. It's just that there is the, is the safety factor of having to get up on your roof periodically and perform that function. And also the EPA is looking over your shoulder to make sure that the algicides that you do use are ultimately biodegradable and cannot be used uh, indiscriminately. Uh, what we're looking at is something that's essentially after the uh, first coating uses zero net chemicals because the oxidizing agents that we use to, to kill the algae are actually photosynthesized. Uh, we're using sunlight to photochemically decompose water and generate a peroxide-like species which does the uh, algae, uh, it fu functions as an algicide. So in the same way that the, the, the algae actually is living off of the, the moisture and the, the sunlight, you're finding things that, that will create the necessary, make the environment hostile for them so they can't survive right. up there anymore. Essentially, instead of having to go up there and spray an algicide on it, we're photochemically generating the algicide on the roof as the, uh, on its own. Now you have a test roof, basically, that's set up. What, what, give us an idea as we look at some of the pictures as to what is on this test roof and, and what, what kind of comparisons you're making. Well, uh, in collaboration with a uh, roofing building products company, uh, we have a test facility down at Homestead where, if you can believe it, the algae growth rate is even uh, more rapid than in Central Florida. And uh, we've put a variety of samples, a variety of photocatalytic formulations on essentially a wooden slab that's pitched just to, to simulate a roof covering. And we're periodically going down and uh, taking reflectivity uh, readings to to monitor the the resilience of the uh, uh, membrane to uh, resist algae growth, and that's been going on for uh, over two years now. What kinds of uh, formulations are you finding uh, seem to work best and, and or worse uh, as as you're as you're making progress in this? Well, this whole field of photocatalytic science seems to be built upon the behavior of a particular compound called titanium dioxide. And why all the various factors focus in on TiO2 might be a, a little beyond the scope of uh, today's discussion, but let's just say that it's, it's a white pigment that absorbs, uh, that's very cheap, very common, and that it absorbs near ultraviolet light. It, its absorption uh, is typically right on the edge of the visible spectrum. So uh, there's, there's a perhaps 10% of the solar spectrum, uh, the UV portion is absorbed by the titania. It's able to convert that light into, let's, let's call it an oxidizing potential, which can then in turn be used to decompose water and generate our hydroxyl radicals, which do, the, do, our, uh, do our hard work on the, uh, on the algae trying to grow. Now is some form of, I want to say some form of titanium is currently used in, in some forms of paint now that you can buy commercially. Very commonly so. In fact, um, uh, many white paints or light colored paints contain uh, titanium oxide as, one, as, its, as a constituent. And the difference is that in the paint industry, um, photocatalytic activity is discouraged. And so they deliberately deactivate the, the TiO2 so that it can't uh, go after the binder uh, and basically chalkify their, uh, their paint uh, coating. Uh, our approach instead is to apply it in such a way 
that the binder <coughs> will resist the action of the uh, hydroxyl radicals and that instead can be used to uh, attack the microorganisms that try to attach. Well, I jumped you from roofs to paint, so let's go back to the roof just for a second to clarify that we really can't, I mean, you don't paint your roof per se. I mean, that's you usually have most people have well, their shingles Well, actually, on. well, people, uh, it's common enough in Florida, especially for the ceramic and cement uh, tile roofings, there, mm -hmm. there are painted surfaces, so it's not that that's uh, impossible, but there are other means of attaching the photocatalyst, and that's uh, that's uh, part of the research work that we're doing is how to make a, a permanent bonding of our photocatalyst to the surface that can withstand the weathering effects of Florida climate, uh, but and, and be able to survive for a reasonable lifetime of the product. Uh, have you been able to, to come upon a, a better shingle, as it were? Well, I, as I say, we've, we've got some samples that we've had field testing now for uh, close to two and a half years now. And from best we can tell, there's been no degradation of the photocatalytic coating. And that the, just by visual inspection, it's obvious that the reflectivity uh, perhaps may not be as the same as it was brand new, but nevertheless is holding up much better than the control samples that did not have a photocatalytic coating. Now, what's preventing uh, this from becoming a commercially available product? I mean, if you've, you've got two years of testing now, obviously it, these things do take time, but um, what, what kind of um, stumbling blocks you're running into to, to get making this more of a commercially available type thing? I suppose it's, it's a matter of uh, convincing various commercial uh, manufacturing firms that it's a, it's a viable technology and it represents energy savings for the state of Florida. Uh, we are in actively discussing the technology with several commercial firms, and it just takes time to go from the bench top in the lab to the boardroom of corporate America to, to get that worked out, but we're confident if we keep at it that uh, we'll, we'll eventually uh, uh, see this on uh, most of the, at least the commercial buildings in the state of Florida, and then uh, maybe at that point branch out to the domestic sector. Well, let's jump to the paints then. As we were talking before uh, the program started, you've got some different elements uh, that you've, you've in incorporated in, in the paints, and, and not only does that change the color, but also, I guess, their ability to, uh, to withstand the, the attack of the algae. That's right. Well, yeah, the several samples, uh, we've, we've got a, several different formulations that we've uh, come up with to combat algae growth. And they, they do have different colors. And uh, we have a bit, a bit of a, an, an aesthetic rationale for doing that, but the main reason was to make a better photocatalyst. Uh, one, uh, the basic reaction, the basic photocatalytic reaction is electrochemical based. Just as in a battery, you've got a positive and a negative electrode, each doing their own respective reaction. The photocatalyst also has to perform two electrochemical reactions, one water splitting, the other uh, converting oxygen in the air back to water. Well, you need a catalyst for both those functions. And so typically we'll take a, what we call a co-catalyst and combine it with our photocatalyst so that both chemical reactions can proceed with great facility. So the product, uh, the color is just a byproduct of that uh, effort to combine two different types of catalysts to perform the, the two different functions. So maybe we can just kind of go down the list here a little bit and, and give us an idea of some of the things that you have utilized in, in combination with uh, titanium oxide, is that correct? That's correct, that's correct. Now I know one of them that you mentioned that we talked about earlier was, was titanium. That's and, right. Uh, so just obviously... Using, just using, well, just using titanium oxide by itself is quite effective. We have been able, in, in, uh, in aqueous experiments, sub, uh, submarine uh, experiments, we've been able to demonstrate that uh, we can get a... Uh, uh, a 70 to 80 percent drop in the rate of algae growth just by using the photocatalyst by itself without photocatalyst. On the other hand, using some other formulations where we're using co-catalyst to promote the, the oxygen reaction, well, we're actually getting up to 90 percent reduction in the rate of, of algae growth. So you figure if some guy has to go up and, and, and uh, pressure wash his roof, uh, uh, one, let's, say, let's say every other year, well, you multiply by factor of 10, now he only has to go up once in 20 years, which is essentially the, the, the lifetime of the roof. Now, titanium being an expensive metal, uh, are there other uh, elements, uh, metals, that might be a little more um, uh, cost effective for a commercial type product? Well, certainly we've got formulations that, uh, that uh, combine iron and, uh, and carbon, graphitic carbon as, as catalyst. 
but titanium dioxide, the, uh, the oxide cells in the anatase uh, polymorph, a particular type of TiO2, sells for about a uh, dollar a pound. And so that, that figures, okay, it's $2,000 a ton, but on the other hand, the coating is only 10 grams per square meter. And so, for, so a pound of TiO2 can cover a couple hundred square meters, uh, the rooftop of a small house. And so the actual, the cost of the, because of the, the, the dispersion is so thin, even at, at a dollar a pound, it's the, compared to the cost of the labor of, of actually putting on the roof coating and the cost of the membrane itself, uh, we think that represents a negligible uh, uh, cost factor. This it may be beyond the scope of this discussion, but, but um, with the cost of oil going up, the cost of asphalt shingles have been going up, uh, is it one of those factors where we're starting to see where it may be much more cost effective to get rid of our old shingles and, and really think very seriously about a painted or a tile or some other type of, of, of roofing material, uh, perhaps with, uh, with uh, some of the photocatalytic uh, chemical on it? Well, certainly, uh, I think the, the Florida Solar Energy Center has uh, lots of data uh, where we've shown that uh, non-asphalt shingle uh, roofing coatings, particularly the light-colored ones, uh, result in a lot less heat gain by your roof and, and lower your, your air conditioning bill. And it's just that some of those roof coatings are, do tend to be expensive and so hopefully, and also I think there's just a general resistance for the, for the public to install a light colored roof on their house because they know eventually they're going to have to go up there and clean it. And so what, what I look at this work, if nothing else, we're trying to alleviate the concern for the consumer that a light colored roof is a high maintenance uh, undertaking and that hopefully what we can do is uh, this work can get the, uh, the general public to to put light colored roofs on their house and, 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 and not, be, not have to go up there uh, uh, every, every so often and they have to, to clean it. Figure out how to make it fashionable, in other words, right. in some respects. So, and in our, in our final little just a minute or two that we've got left, uh, we're, we're talking about the different compositions here. Um, now, is it restricted? One thing that's going to be a, a selling point, if you will, is, is what can I do with the color scheme of it? And realizing that's cosmetic, and we're really talking more in the environment side of it, but uh, do these necessarily come in? Can you only get titanium in a white, for example? Can you only get an iron in, in this kind of a yellowish color? Uh, that's basically correct. Ain't it? Uh uh, I hate to be like uh, Henry Ford, uh, but uh, any you can have any color you want so long <laughs> as it's white. I guess it would be the opposite. But actually, it, it's not that. Now, if uh, It's a function of, I think it, it, you got, it's going to have to be a trade-off of what color you would like and what level of performance you, you'd want. Uh, and so that, uh, the, for example, to go from the light-colored coating to the uh, orange-colored coating, the, the, the loss of algae inhib inhibition ability is negligible. They're about the same. Uh, the platinum uh, here and here, and also the carbon. Uh, you may not like the dark color. Uh, it does make for more heat gain by the roof, but uh, that's, those are 90% materials. You're not going to get any algae growth on it. Uh, tungsten oxide, this one uh, you probably want to stay away from. But the nickel, the manganese, maybe not bad. They would be. They might be a reasonable. If you want a green, if you want a green roof, <laughs> then uh, that might be a possibility because they're pretty good algae inhibitors. So sometime you can go into the store and order the. I like the platinum with a uh, little titanium trim, perhaps a little uh, additional. It could of come to that. that. <laughs> it could, indeed, it could come to that. Dr. Clovis Lingus, thank you so much for joining us today and continue your work. I know as you will, and uh, we'll come back and talk about it in the future and uh, maybe hope save some energy and some money maybe in the process. Very good. We hope to do so. All right. Thank you, sir. And you stay with us. We'll be right back after our research minute. Now you will find my music. The songs will be, would be therapy based. So it might not just be song. It could just be sounds, but it would be within the context of the game. So you are being scored or you're having to overcome obstacles based on how well you perform the exercises. You have a rivalry that's been going on and one day she destroys your opera house. Well, you return to find your opera house in ruins and uh, you say, look, we need to have this out right now. It's either you or me, I want my fans. And she says, no, I'll take them from you. So you engage in a singing battle. What we're able to do is we're able to uh, record sounds from the game and then able to analyze the sounds and send them across the network so that a clinician doesn't have to be 
close to the patient. They can be all the way across the country in Oklahoma or someplace and collaborate with speech therapists that are here in Florida. Another Zenith has come to an end, but we're always available on the web at www.zenith.ucf.edu. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. I'm Ed Highland. We'll see you next time.